All right. Good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to our uh, premiere of India Americas with David Yetman. Um, this is the first one we've done in a very long time. We actually had one set up for uh, just as we were going into the pandemic. So, you know, the rest is sort of history. Um, so we're very glad to be here, and uh, we welcome you, and we're so grateful that you showed up tonight. This is really such a, just such a great crowd and such a tribute to what uh, Dave and Dan have been doing. Uh, my name is Jeff Bannister, and I'm the director of the Southwest Center. We're a small research unit in the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences. Uh, we've been around since the probably late 1980s. Um, and Dave and Dan, uh, Dave Yetman and Dan Duncan are part of that unit, and we are the producer, actually, of, uh, of In the Americas. In the Americas is not produced anywhere else but the Southwest Center, this little research unit at the University of Arizona. So I'm going to just quickly introduce uh, all of us here tonight who are who have made this event possible and who have been working on in the Americas. Uh, and then I'll turn it over to Dave and he's gonna introduce the programs and we're gonna get right into it. And then we will have um, hopefully a good chunk of time at the end to uh, field any questions you have about the program and uh, the content, anything. So, uh, so again, thank you for coming. And I also wanna say thanks so much to uh, the people who have been helping us over the years with financial support, both for the Southwest Center uh, and for in the Americas, we could not at all do this kind of programming without your support. So, so thank you. We're deeply grateful. Okay, so with me tonight, of course, is Dr. David Yetman. Um, <laughs> Dave, is, uh, Dave is a doctor of philosophy, so you, if you have any philosophical ailments, he can help you out, certainly. <laughs> Uh, also with me is, uh, of course, uh, Dan Duncan, who's the, the producer and filmographer of this uh, beautiful television. And then uh, up there filming the whole thing and actually having coordinated all of this is uh, Carlos Quintero, who is the uh, outreach coordinator for the South Coast. Mm -hmm. uh, again, thanks for coming, and I will hand over the mic. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, the first program we're going to see um, is uh, Tlaloc's Revenge. Tlaloc was the god of water of the Aztecs. Um, and this is really is a program is uh, an offshoot of my department director's research. My department director who tells me what I may do and may not is uh, Dr. Jeff Bannister. Um, but uh, uh, Jeff is really uh, the, the brains behind this first program. Uh, in the second program, which we filmed, uh, uh, by the way, the Tlaloc's Revenge we filmed just before the pandemic hit. Uh, the second program is on Lake Powell, which we filmed last April. And the credits don't do just really justify, uh, justifiable honor to those who helped. And I want to introduce one person who isn't there but is here tonight, Dr. Alberto Borges, who was the, the gaffer, the audio assistant, uh, for the Lake Powell program. Alberto, will you just raise your hand so people can see you? <laughs> he was the highest trained daffer we have ever had, a PhD from Cambridge University, but he was really good. But the, uh, the two programs take about a half hour each, and following that, um, my esteemed colleague Daniel Duncan has put together a, a brief synopsis of season 11 programs. I will not be re held, held responsible for their content. <laughs> uh, can we have the lights uh, dim, lowered, and uh, shot out, please? So um, now we're going to just uh, have a little bit of time to field some questions and talk a little bit about the, well, whatever you want to talk about, actually, uh, but the making of uh, in the Americas and talk about those episodes. So I'm going to turn the mic over to Dave. And I think, uh, what is our plan here? Dave, me, and Dan can kind of hang out here and give you a little rundown. I hope you all appreciate the uh, heroic efforts of my close friend, uh, Daniel Duncan. Um, 
it, it's hard for many of you to appreciate how active he is with the camera, and he is always seeing new things. And if you look very carefully at these programs, you can see dozens of different angles, challenges, um, things that he subjects me to that a normal human being should not have to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but I, I do also want to point out that in order to get permission to film among the Mahim the Crow, uh, we had to buy him a cow. <laughs> And the financial office at the University of Arizona had to scratch their heads a little bit when we turned in the receipt for a cow. <laughs> Dan, why don't you come join us? And uh, uh, I, what I would like, first of all, is you to just give us a, a couple minutes about uh, your activity and what you see and these, what you have done. Uh, it's interesting because the technological advances for shooting have changed so much over the years. I remember the first trip down the Grand Canyon where we took a huge HD camera that cost $100,000 and weighed probably 80 pounds was replaced by a little GoPro <laughs> shoots underwater. To get those underwater shots 10 years ago, we took a fish tank of all things, strapped it to the top of a raft and floated down the Grand Canyon. Probably not the safest thing to do, but the... Uh, the ability to um, tell stories with images and sound have changed over the years because of the technological advances. You can probably see that a lot of our programs include a lot of drone shots, which give it that vantage point that you couldn't get otherwise. I remember when we shot a program down the Pinacates, you know, we'd have to rent a Jet Ranger helicopter for $750 an hour, um, and now we just do it with a little drone that costs you know a fraction of that. So anyway, that's a huge change in shooting over the years. Um, we have a great uh, series coming up with season 11. And it's great that Dave is uh, out there and doing everything, including getting baptized. By the <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. How do you decide where to go and what to film? What country in this? We go through quite a laborious process of screening, um, evaluating proposals, uh, making geographical inquiries, um, uh, conducting international surveys, but mostly I think Dan and I go to Bob Dobbs and say, where do we want to go next? <laughs> I don't know what the current cost would have been had it been built now, but it was enormous. Um, it's going to have all kinds of ramifications, but the Bureau of Reclamation, uh, which are now, uh, they used to be the uh, Furies and now they're the kind angels, I guess. Um, they have to make a very tough decision as to where is the water, where is the water going to go, and they have chosen quite clearly that Lake Mead is the priority because it has the greater um, uh, closeness to the lower to the lower basin, California and Arizona, uh, Nevada gets a small amount of, of water from it, but that's where mostly it goes. Then the upper basin, which is uh, the area, all the river above Lee's Ferry, have to make serious uh, uh, changes in their overall allocations too. But one thing to consider, and um, I, I'm glad I've got to do gotten to do the Colorado River a few times. It's going to be very difficult for river runners once the lake is decommissioned, or the dam is decommissioned and water runs through there, because it would be much more difficult to gauge how much water is going to be available and what times of year they'll be able to run the river. So there's going to be quite a swath, understandably so, from people who have, over the years, provided us with this wonderful rafting experience going down the canyon. Um, but in, in, overall, we also have to consider that the lakes themselves are enormous wasters of water. When Lake um, Mead was full, um, and this was 40 years ago when it was not as hot as it is now, it evaporated close to 900,000 acre-feet of water a year, which at the time was more than Arizona's total water consumption. Um, that has, because the surface area is now less, the total evaporation is less. But it is also hotter, so a greater amount 
per square foot is now being evaporated. And also, the, in the upper basin, uh, where you get the same amount of snowfall now, you don't, but if you, even if you did, it doesn't last as long because it's hotter, it evaporates more, melts more quickly, and runs off. So everything has changed. But ultimately, I don't think the, uh, the, the uh, water authorities, the Bureau of Reclamation, the states have any choice but to decommission a dam. And as, uh, as the novelist Sir Genef once said, uh, such things have nearly ceased to exist nowadays. Heaven knows whether we should rejoice or despair. Yeah. I was wondering, how, how big is your production crew when you go on these, these travels? <laughs> <laughs> I do want to want to point out that uh, back there, the voice that you hear uh, telling who our sponsors are, Cobo, would you stand up? Is uh, my dear friend, producer, musician, Jacobo Ramirez. <laughs> On other occasions, uh, Kim Durazo is here. Kim, would you stand? And uh, the crew is Dan and me, and we try to recruit somebody else to do the uh, audio and to be the assistant. But, oh, he Hector Gonzalez says, Hector, stand up. Um, if you see the graphics, this is the guy who does the graphics. And uh, as you can see in the programs, without that talent, without his ability to bring maps and, and bring the locations into a worldwide perspective, the program could not be the same. So that our crew, on the ground filming is Dan and me and whoever we take along. But we also have uh, Hector who does the mapping. We also have an assistant uh, who does a lot of the fine tuning from the program. Um, we are a very tiny crew. And uh, some people would say what we lack in numbers, we really lack in, in quality. No, no, no. <laughs> yes. How long on average uh, are you filming for one episode? Or does it just depend on how difficult the episode is and where you're going? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, every program is totally different. Sometimes we'll go in and shoot an entire program in two days. Other times it'll take an entire week or two weeks to shoot a program. Um, every program kind of dictates, uh, you know, what, what the outcome is. What we do is totally unscripted. We go in, we have an idea. Dave has an idea. We kind of have an idea how we want to open and close it. What's in between? No idea whatsoever. <laughs> Other than the program we did with Jeff. And he had a really good uh, concept as far as he, what he wanted to show. And I think he has some good parallels between the two programs. Perhaps. Perhaps. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Um, well, I just say by way of a kind of um, public service announcement or infomercial, uh, Season 11, I think, has a couple of programs coming up on uh, focusing on uh, Christopher Columbus and also Cortez uh, that involve Spain. And our uh, outreach coordinator, Carlos Quintero, helped set those up. Uh, Dave and Dan and Carlos traveled to Spain, so uh, be on the lookout for those. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, actually, speaking of Cortez, uh, the Tlaloc's Revenge. I, I really liked that episode, and I spend a lot of time in Mexico City, and I'm happy to report that Tlaloc is very popular as a mythological character and very venerated even today. Um, but speaking of Cortes, is it Tlaloc's revenge because of all the destruction of the sacred site around the Templo Mayor, or why was it named Tlaloc's revenge? Uh, that's a good question. So for, for those who don't know, Tlaloc is the is a Aztec water deity. And so I think the revenge part was just to talk about how uh, the development of Mexico City over that lake environment um, has produced all kinds of socio and environmental, social and environmental contradictions that have kind of come back to haunt the city. And so um, that, that in, including subsidence and water scarcity and, and other things. So I think that that is, is really what that's in reference to. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think that uh, Tlaloc is actually sort of shaking his head and trying to say, I, I tried to tell them and they wouldn't listen. <laughs> as, it ha as Tlaloc is with, uh, I mean, this region as well. You know, I think Dan was asking me during the, um, as we were watching the two, the two episodes, what kind of parallels could you draw between, you know, the Colorado River Basin and Mexico City, which are many. Um, but I think one of the things that, 
you know, that we're all experiencing is a kind of environmental reckoning in this moment. And, uh, and that reckoning has happened for many communities in many places for, I know all of you know that, I mean, for ma in many places for a long time, but now it's kind of a generalizing thing. So, you know, across the Colorado River Basin that is, um, you know, supplying or, or the home of probably what, 40 million to 45 million people. Um, now we're, <clears throat> we're experiencing a kind of backlash of this incredible <clears throat> plumbing system and this incredibly um, interventionist way, interventionist in the environment way uh, of seeing that has created this, this system that we're so, we're, you know, we're all so dependent on. And so now we're being forced to think of things in a very different way and very quickly. Um, and I think, you know, if that, if that consciousness doesn't shift fast enough, it's going to be difficult for us to, to, to move forward really as a species, I think. But, you know, there's a lot of opportunities and a lot of beauty in that as well. So, uh, and Mexico City is a very good, uh, good example of that. You know, 25 million people in that, in that basin dependent on water that's coming in largely from outside of it. Um, and so that's, you know, that's kind of a reckoning. That is a reckoning in and of itself, so. Yes. The reckoning, I think here is probably not well understood. And when you speak about 45 million people in residential type uses, how does that compare to agricultural use and the impact that has on the Colorado compact and the river? Well, I mean, I think, yeah, you know, the, the, the demands on the Colorado River system on the, on, part of that, on the part of agriculture are vast, um, very big compared to, um, you know, to urban demands, suburban demands, right? Um, but, you know, we're all in this together in different ways, of course. And I, and I, I want to stress in different ways, right? Because, you know, there are um, many ways and many groups of people who are not nearly responsible for the problems that we're facing as other groups are so it's you know it, it is actually being meted out this this struggle in our in our political system um, and it is superseding our politics you know and so we're in this you know we're in this moment that uh, you know of, of political uh, you know political processes spilling out over the well constructed canals that we have you know built over the years so that's, I think, you know, a lot of what we're dealing with. That's a very roundabout way, yeah, <laughs> way of very, it. trying to be tactful <laughs> because, you know, it's, it, I mean, I think that it's, uh, yeah. But isn't it, it about 70% of the use from the color of agricultural? Yes, yeah. But of course, you know, there's also a geography to that. It's very an uneven geography, but yeah, I think yeah. that's about right. I think Dave probably has something to say about that too. Yeah, over 40 years ago, Philip Fradkin wrote a book called The River No More, which is a study of the Colorado River. At that time, 65% of the Colorado's water went to uh, beef production. What that meant was not only a direct irrigation of pastures or raising of alfalfa, and the seed from cottonseed, which was at that time a, a, a huge uh, part of the cattle industry. Um, that has changed, obviously, because now specialty crops are being raised in both the Imperial Valley and the, and the Yuma Valley. Um, so that has changed, but still an inordinately large proportion of that uh, goes toward agriculture and the Imperial Valley. And the Imperial Valley is the hottest place in the United States with the greatest rate of evaporation, the greatest demands uh, per crop per acre foot of water um, with huge political power as they always had. The, the Imperial Valley was originally called the Colorado Desert. Speculators from uh, New York bought up the land, decided that was not a desirable name, changed it to the Imperial Valley to attract uh, <clears throat> suckers from New York, etc. <laughs> Your point is very well taken. Yes? Where's like the place um, or experience that both of you have not gone yet that you would like to go to or experience. It doesn't have to be in the Americas. Um, boy, there's so many. Uh, there's a, a series of islands off the northeastern coast of Brazil called Fernando Noronha. That's sort of like they call it the Galapagos of Brazil. We have not done a program there. Um, that would be uh, one of my top five, I think, places to go. 
interesting enough, of all the programs we've done, the most watched program was a program on in Oaxaca on whistling speech. I don't know if you've seen oh, that. Yeah. <laughs> but of all the programs we've done, that's we uh, today we just got a carriage report, which was kind of cool from PBS, um, in that we are our penetration distribution is 92 percent of the entire country, and we're also distributing. Yes. It's, it's interesting that traveling with Dave, we cannot walk through security without somebody coming up to him, <laughs> wanting their photograph taken with, with Dr. Dave Yetman here. And Dr. Yetman, do you have a place or experience like that you've got to do or you haven't done yet? You know, I, I like traveling north and south, and the reason is you don't get as much jet lag. <laughs> so, you know, if you go east and west, you know, that, that's just, you, know, you get worn out. And by the way, I think the mean age of this group is probably somewhere around 74. And you understand what I mean. For those of you who are, are puppies, you wouldn't know what we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> so I sort of, I, I sort of uh, turn down my hearing aids when people talk about going east or west, and I like to go south. Uh, I, would, I would, there are a couple of places I would love to go. I would like to go, um, first of all, I want to do more in the Amazon before, uh, you know, it's too late. Um, but I would love to, uh, to film in Southern Patagonia in Chile. We have filmed in Southern Patagonia in Argentina uh, to, uh, to our great benefit. It's uh, terrific. It's hard to get there. It's very expensive. The infrastructure is not as great, but that's a place I would love to go. Um, and there's a place in the U.S. I would like to visit. But um, um, national parks have become much easier for us to film in. And to our great advantage, just Several years ago, a, um, an outfitter sued the National Park Service for its fees and the requirements uh, for filming. And their lawsuit was successful. As a result, the National Park Service put an end to issuing permits and they said, small operations such as we are will no longer even have to report. We can go into the parks and we can film, which is a huge benefit. We used to have to pay $600 plus hire a guide. Uh, to film within any unit of the national park system. Now we can sneak in and do whatever we did them, please. <laughs> but there's a, there's a lot of that. Yes? So you said it's just the two of you on the ground when you're filming, and, and whoever else you decide to take along. How, how does one go about being that guy? <laughs> <laughs> okay. there's, a, there's a little bit of a waiting list. <laughs> Yeah, what, what we try to do wherever we go, we try to have somebody who's, who's a local as much as possible. So if we're going to Brazil, we want someone who's Portuguese speaking. And same with, with Mexico, somebody who's Spanish speaking. But um, Jacobo and, and Hector are some of our go-to guys. And of course, Kim is our number one uh, choice in that matter. So, yeah. um, one of the scenes that you will get to see um, in the uh, when season 11 does come out, when you're filling with the crow, um, I took some photographs of crow children looking at Dan's iPhone, which he can see when he's running the drone. Their first view of what their place looked like from above, and he is completely surrounded by these awestruck young children, and they are utterly beautiful, let me tell you. Um, and that's one of the things that's most rewarding is to be able to go places, and we, we try to go places that aren't usually popular, and uh, get people who aren't f generally familiar with being filmed and get their reaction to see what we can do. So is season 12 already in the works? Um, season, we're just finishing up season 11, and season 12 we have a, a small hit list including uh, the southern region of Brazil and Uruguay. Um, we just have a few more minutes. Um, we have a couple gifts uh, for the right answers to give away. Whoa. So if you guys want some swag, we've, we've got a, a nice little poster of In the Americas, similar to the one you saw on, you know, coming into the, the theater. But you have to answer a question, and that is, you know, Dave is famous for his hat. And after 10 seasons of In the Americas, he he sacrificed his hat. And the question is, if we had not, well, we followed park, you know, the, the park services, you know, guidelines as far as leave no trays. 
But had we have not done that, where would that hat have ended up? Any guesses? I think I heard it over here. Colorado River. Colorado River, so it would have ended up in Lake Mead, so you will receive a poster. Um, we also have uh, a couple DVDs. Does anybody still use DVDs out there? What's that? <laughs> what is that? Um, I'm sorry? Well, the other question is, uh, I was going to say, when did the great patriarch come from the West? But I have to continue. No, um, oh, yeah, you asked the question. The um, overall effect of our programs often is people calling me or Dan or even Jeff at the Southwest saying, why don't you guys film X? And where would you like to see something filmed? Greenland. Well, I mean, I, I, I agree. Greenland is wonderful, and it is also, I view it as part of the Americas, because it is part of the North American plate. And whatever is part of the North American plate counts as being in the Americas. <laughs> I have ruled that. But getting there is hell, and once you're there, it's hell. Other than that, it's terrific. <laughs> you, have to, you have to fly to Copenhagen and then to Reykjavik. From Reykjavik, you have to find a place that you can land in at the right time of year in Greenland, infrastructure there. Um, and if anyone has an extra $100,000 they would like to uh, endow the program with, we will work out a way to get to Greenland. Copper Canyon. I'm sorry? Copper Canyon. Oh, yeah. Uh, Copper Canyon, a fabulous place. Copper Canyon in, um, in uh, northern Sinaloa, southwestern Chihuahua. Um, there's a big problem now with filming in Copper Canyon. And that is the only access is through the railroad. There's been quite a little crime along the railroad line. The railroad runs sporadically for that reason. Um, and it's time consuming. It's very difficult to get there. We have fa actually filmed for the Desert Speaks in the very upper reaches of, um, of, of, of the Tarahumara country, the Rarongwea country. Um, but filming there has always been logistically really a challenge for us. So um, if we could figure out how to do it, have armed guards perhaps all the way up, um, it, and it's a possibility, but it certainly is a, a place that deserves it. We have never done it, and that's a really a, a great omission on our part. One more, yes? Forest of Piney in uh, Southern Chile. I'm sorry? Forest of Piney. Yes, it, um, I'm not gonna climb it. It's Torres del Paine, which is a, a huge granitic peak, a charismatic place, one of the top climbing, uh, uh, what can I call it, shrines of the world. Um, and also the weather is a real tricky part in Torres del Paine because you can be climbing. I'm not going to climb it, I, I, you know, but uh, you can be perfectly clear and 15 minutes later you can be in a, a very wet fog that uh, can make climbing tough. It's a, it, climatically it's tough, but it's also one of the most lovely places anywhere in the world and certainly in the Americas. Yeah. How about the Darien Gap? Um, I, I saw today that um, according to a Mexican newspaper, the Biden administration had proposed to Panama that they construct a wall across the Darien Gap. Um, Darien Gap is, the, is the, uh, the piece of land that connects the settled part of Panama with the coast of uh, Colombia. And until the last 10 or 15 years, uh, was a major protection against any invasion of pests from South America to North America because there were no roads. And it has now become a major hub for migrants and, uh, and uh, people who do naughty things. Um, so that's a really tough one. Um, I think the danger there would be horrific right now if we were to try to do that. And it's, it's too bad because it was really one of the last great sh uh, shrines of uh, untrammeled tropical forest in the world, um, that's changed. You, yes? I'm just curious, how did this chemistry Well, I was innocently doing field work in southern, so the question was how did this chemistry start? When somebody asked me, um, suggested that I go to Alamos because people were filming the Desert Peaks there, 
and I, I met Dan, and then a couple years later I was doing field work. Um, he asked me, or someone from KUT asked me if they could film my project, and I said, oh, if you're really nice to me, I'll let you. Um, and that was 1993 or 1994, and Dan and I seemed to hit it off at that point. Uh, we used to produce a series called The Desert Speaks, and that series went on for 20 years. After the first 10 years, PBS came and says, hey, you guys need more of an interactive host, not just the book and uh, George Page kind of host. And so we're like, after 10 years, ah, oh, we need somebody like David Yetman. Yeah. And so we're like, well, who's like David Yetman? And so we're like, oh, so-and-so, so-and-so, fulano, fulano, fulano. Until we said, why don't we just ask David Yetman? <laughs> and at that point, he became the host of The Desert Speaks. And that transitioned after um, KUAT discontinued The Desert Speaks. The Southwest Center picked us up for In the Americas. And so we're in our 11th season, going strong, hopefully 12, 13, 14. <laughs> well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. This has been really lovely. Um, actually, I, wanted, I want to do one more plug. The Southwest Center, every now and then we do some travel study trips, and we're doing one to Alamos with Dave, um, Alamos uh, Sonora, uh, the, almost to the Sinaloa border, beautiful area. Uh, and that'll be in March, early March of next year. We've been, for those of you who don't see our newsletter, we'll try to get you all on there if you're interested. Um, we'll be sending out information for that um, pretty soon. So, And that, that actually, that trip's great because it's a fundraiser for a bird observatory that's uh, in southern Sonora as well. So your, your uh, trip fee will go toward a good cause, um, and you'll get to hang out with Dave. So. Anyway, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dan.